Are we ready? All right, colleagues, we are not endorsed by AAA, nor we are paid by the insurance company, but we are three A's and Sky. Alexi, Asia, Afrin, and Skylar. Hopefully, we will be your insurance to success on the exam, though. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> our topic is gestation, and this is a general definition on our article, which is a sense of the, and the beginning with the excitation of cells, taste buds, and leading to proprioception of uh, perception of taste qualities. And the general are unami, salty, bitter, sour, sweet, and fat is hitting the, the radar. So taste buds on the tongue, we have, they are about aggregates of 50 to 100 polarized uh, neuroepithelial cells. And without taste, how would our world look like? Just imagine every day eating sawdust, no taste. It's a horrible life. Some, some people might consider losing sense of vision than taste, because it would be really hard. But we're going to spice it up. I mean, really spice it up. <laughs> Our world is going to be colorful with taste. And the good thing is that we own it. We own this taste. The only sensory uh, sense that dentists really are in control of or are responsible for knowing. Sense is most in, it's an, an most intrepid um, sense. It's conducted to solitary nucleus. It's really easy to remember solitary because S starts for sense and solitary. Also sense, uh, it, it, the taste it initiates reflexes. Let's talk about this particular image right here, the senses that we have, um, and why senses are important for us humans, as in animals, it is very important for us to be able to distinguish from sources of nutrients and stay away from sources of harm to our body as biological um, beings. That's right. Unami, umami, actually. I have to confess, only now I really learned what umami is. When I went to Asian stores, I was like, what is that? <laughs> umami. But they speak of this sense. So, umami is the sense of umami. Umami, yes. Umami. My mommy, your mommy, umami. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Umami, umami. Yes. These particular receptors on our taste buds are tuned to L glutamate and other levatory amino acids. These particular amino acids, they represent proteins from which our bodies can benefit and we are tuned to them. Another sense is salt, why it's important for us. And it's very important to maintain proper balance in our body because salt intake really affects our uh, balance of water and it affects blood pressure and as we have spoken before, that all animals, we like some salt in our food, but too much of it we avoid because it will cause harm to our body. Another sense is bitter taste. Bitter is innately aversive, and we are generally try to avoid it because bitter taste is associated with poisons and harmful things to our body. But interestingly, coffee is bitter tasting substance. We tend to like it and seek it. Also, when we talk about sour, sour is it's an, 
it's a, t it's a sense of actually acidification, intracellular acidification, and it's very important for our body to maintain that um, sense because we help our body maintain pH balance. If we intake too much acid, we already know that we can harm our teeth with it and other problems can arise, but we also seek out lemons, we like that. Even though we tend to associate sour sometimes with spoiled foods, so when we taste it, we stay away from it to prevent harm to our body, which is very uh, important there. And sweet, our brain associates this, this, this particular taste with the sorts of carbs or energy, so we tend to really like it. Um, also, we have a fat on the radar there. We, I didn't hear much about it, and probably you haven't too, but it's hitting the radar, and I believe soon it's going to be as a regular taste, accepted as regular taste too. So, pertaining taste preferences, the taste preferences, they are in influenced by genetic genetics. So if you, you might see that particular um, residents of various countries have different preferences, and it's all based genetically also. The way taste works in our body is it's very important that it initiates specific reflexes. And we also have taste sensors in our stomach, which triggers, let's see, it triggers psychological reflexes as for gut absorption. So when our body senses that we have, for instance, um, food in our mouth, the body prepares peristalsis. We have an increased mesencephalic uh, circulation for absorption. We also have um, increased heart rate to increase the mesencephalic circulations, for instance. But the combination of these physiological um, things plus some activation of secretion of insulin, for instance, that prepares our body for digestion and um, other uh, processes. The combination of those things plus the visual, the smell, it uh, allows for a cephalic phase response. That's the definition of cephalic phase response is the combination of those, all, all those factors. One thing to note that taste does not equal flavor because flavor is, an olfact, is, is a combination of olfaction plus gustation. Olfaction is a sense of volatile compounds through our nose and taste it's for wa uh, liquid water soluble compounds. So we need to be able to differentiate that. Also, it is very common that taste is um, confused with somatosensory sensations. And we do remember we had an exam question regarding um, pepper on our tongue. Was it taste or was it pain? So that's activated actually by lingual nerve. Uh, a pain receptor for capsaicin, I believe. So that's very important to differentiate. Different nerve, it's not glossopharyngeal. And besides that, we're going to cover a um, molecular basis of all the, of taste. We're not going to talk about psychological senses. And, f and th with that being said, I'm going to pass the microphone to Asia. No, just want to reiterate on this uh, topic, flavor and taste. Flavor, you have a lot of olfactory input there. Uh, 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 taste is just these modalities that we talked about. Uh, fat is still not accepted as uh, a taste modality. We don't know if it's going to become accepted, so we are still dis uh, discussing this issue. However, flavor, uh, just imagine uh, that even your visual senses, you look at it's 11.35. You look at that picture, you look at the line and the uh, uh, lemon there, you already start uh, uh, having uh, 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 your 
salivary gland producing extra saliva. So uh, this is really what the general uh, activity of taste is. Remember also that uh, taste also has a lot of additional, I, I think you're going to talk about that, the reward systems that are also activated that get to there. So, but I'm going to stop there. So please ask you. All right. So I'm just going to um, introduce taste buds first. So as we know, taste buds are located within the oral cavity, within uh, the tongue, and we also have some taste buds in our palate and the esophagus and so forth. And they're surrounded by uh, your oral epithelial cells, um, but them themselves are polarized, neuroepithelial cells. They're mature and they are differentiated and uh, they are columnar pseudostratified. So they look stratified, but they're really pseudostratified, right? And they're surrounded by oral epithelium, which is just stratified epithelium and non-sensory. And one thing to remember is that they're continuously renewing. So they're not just there and that's all you have. They're renewing. They're, there's new cells being born uh, and to replace the old. Um, now, taste buds themselves are made up of supporting cells that are the outer cells, and then we have the gustatory cells, or the taste cells, and those cells are the ones we're going to be focusing on. They're the ones with the receptors. Some have receptors, and some don't. We will talk about which ones do and which ones don't, and what they, what they have um, particularly that identifies them. And if you look at the picture also, you'll see the apical portion of the taste bud is at the top. <laughs> We're used to thinking about apices of the teeth. This is the top of the, of the taste bud. Um, you'll see the gustatory pore. Um, and then you, have, you see the supporting cells and then nerve fibers that are going into that taste bud. And nerve fibers, I'll talk more a, bit, a, a little bit more about that. They're a collection of different fibers that are taking in sensory information let's, about, about your pain, pain and temperature, about um, touch, mechanoception, and also about gustation, correct? They're all together and they're innervating this taste bud. And going forward, these are the three uh, taste cells that I was talking to you about. Um, one thing to keep in mind as I go through this, this presentation is that these cells have feedback and feed forward communication with each other. It's not one cell doing something. These things are working together, okay? And you'll see that as we go forward. So they're type one, type two, the door so something happens. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> type 1, type 2, type 3 cells. We also have basal cells which are considered type 4 cells. Okay, let's go on. Let's, let's, let's look at these. Uh, type 1 cells. These are the most abundant cells in the taste bud. They are considered like glial cells. And you know in the nervous system, glial cells are like the cells that clear neurotransmitters. They're the cells that reset the system. So these cells um, are neuros they 
have the ability uh, to reuptake neurotransmitters. And they do this by, for example, a glutamate transporter called GLAST, and it, it reuptakes glutamate. They also have NTP dase, which is a nucleotidase, okay? And we know that as uh, the, having the ability to hydrolyze ATP. And remember, ATP is one of the main uh, neurotransmitters uh, that are involved in taste reception. And also we'll see uh, serotonin and also neuro, uh, neuropinephrine. Now, um, they also taste uh, type 1 cells also have NET, which is a neuro, uh, norepinephrine transporter or a, a reuptake also. Taste one t type 1 cells also have ion redistribution and transport ability. Now, uh, these cells are really important because when we have a large action potential because of um, a taste, a taste, or something. we're eating something, something sweet to have high action potentials going on in these cells. These guys uh, are responsible to um, bring back the homeostasis in these in, within our cells. So within our taste bud, after an action potential, we have a lot of uh, potassium accumulation. So with the use of ROMK, which is a potassium channel, it releases potassium out. And what happens when, when that happens is hyperpolarization, and we go back to resetting the uh, normal potential of the cell, okay? And then these type cells, type 1 cells, also have, um, also have the ability to transdu transduct uh, the taste of salt. So they have ion currents and they are thought to uh, respond to salt taste. Okay? And now we move on to type 2 cells. Now type 2 cells, in retrospect, they are known as your receptor cells, as the name says. Receptor cells, they have to have receptors, and they do. They have these filaments that go out of the taste pore, and they have receptors on them. Um, they are responsible to, uh, they, re they respond to sweet, unami, and bitter tastings. Okay? Sweet un un and unami are felt by one particular receptor, and I think it's going to be safe, guys. Well, guys. Uh, I'm going to stand by this door. I don't, no, I'm, no, I'm not guys, to, uh, 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 it's safe to turn off the lights here. I would turn off the lights. <laughs> yeah. T1R receptors and T2R receptors. T1R receptors, G protein coupled receptors, they're sensing sweet and umami. umami. T2R receptors, again, G coupled protein receptors, they're sensing bitter. G, uh, T2R are polymodal because bitter is something toxic, so we have a lot of those receptors. We have a ton of T2R receptors. They're sensing bitter. T1R receptors are sensing sweet and unami, okay? Um, type 2 cells also have the ability to uh, produce alpha-gustasin. Alpha-gustasin is produced um, in response to, t to T2R receptors, bitter, okay? If you, if you eat something bitter, T2R receptors are going to sense that. We're going to produce 
alpha-gustasin, and we know that we tasted something bitter. Okay, it's related to bitter taste. Um, type 2 cells, obviously, they have to receive action potentials. How do they do this? They do this through sodium-potassium channels, right? We know that. Um, and type 2 cells um, also release ATP, again, one of the big neurotransmitters. ATP here is released via um, hemi-channels. We don't have synapses in type 2 cells. This is really important. Type 3 cells, when I talk about them, they have synapses, synaptic trans transmission to nerve terminals. Here, we don't have that. So we have ATP releasing through a channel, a hemi-channel, a channel that looks like a, a gap junction channel. If you remember, gap junctions were made out of connections, six connections together. Here, same idea, hemi-channel. There are six connexin-like proteins called panexins. This channel opens up and you have ATP coming out. They're not coming out in a synaptic cleft, they're coming out to, uh, <laughs> basically it's coming out and that information is going to be relayed via type 3 cells. That's what I'm talking about, feedback, feed forward. Um, also, type 2 cells, uh, like I mentioned here, there's no synaptic vesicles and no synaptic signal transmission uh, with any nerve cells. And this is going to be happening in, in type 3 cells. Okay, these guys are the presynaptic cells. As I mentioned, these guys are the ones that relay the information. They integrate the signals generated by type 2 cells that I was just talking to you about. So type 3, presynaptic, they are responsible in detecting the sour taste and carbonation. Okay, um, and these guys have synaptic junctions with t nerve terminals. They have synaptic terminals that they have created. And these guys also release serotonin and norepinephrine. Here, we also have surface glycoproteins and ion channels. And we also have SNAP25. If you read the, the article, we're talking about uh, SNAP25. This is a protein complex. This complex allows the neurotransmitter vesicles to bind to the presynaptic membrane so that they can be exocytosed out. Okay, that is that is or the, that's basically what it is okay it's a protein complex that regulates this process of, of, of vesicle removal into the synaptic cleft we also have ion channels here because we know that type 3 cells are able to respond to sour taste and carbonation it is predicted that they do this by pkd cation channels okay they're able to detect it by that and of course they also have Pot uh, sodium potassium channels and they also have calcium channels and of course they receive information from type 2 receptor cells and uh, like I said they integrate it because these cells are the ones with synaptic transmission ability not type 2 cells okay and then we go into the basal cells so basal cells are obviously undifferentiated they're kind of at the bottom they are the ones that become uh, one of these type cells so they, they differentiate eventually but within it within uh, the cell itself they're undifferentiated they're immature cells and the paper says that we don't really know much about them so their their significance is kind of unknown and then we have nerve cells we have nerve fibers that come in okay the pre uh, uh, axon uh, the per peripheral axon that is coming in um, and and of course we have multiple nerve fibers like I said we have nerve fibers for touch mechanoception we have nerve fibers for for pain and for temperature and and here of course we have taste and we know that taste goes to the solitary nucleus but it runs through specific ganglia ganglia uh, like the geniculate ganglia that is the f uh, the facial nerve ganglia do have petrosal ganglion which is the glossopharyngeal ganglion and we have the nodosal ganglion which is the vagal ganglia okay so they pass pass through the ganglia uh, through the cell body, and then they go off to the solitary nucleus, okay? And then they synapse on the secondary uh, uh, neuron. Um, and the other sensory here, I mentioned pain and temperature. They're going to the spinal trigeminal nucleus, and then the tactile sense, it's going to the chief or principal nucleus of the trigeminal. So they are all innervating this taste bud. They're together. You can't really differentiate them when you look at them, but you know it's there, and they're all carrying different information. And... All right. Um, thank you, Asia, for the introduction to the different. Life goes on as usual out there. They are also interviewing MSMS students today. They're 
for the overview of the different type of cells. Um, so I'm going to cover um, the transduction of gustatory stimuli in receptor type 2 cells, the presynaptic type 3 cells, um, and the fault detection and transduction. So let's go over in detail the type of receptors. First I'll go over um, bitter and then sweet and then umami. And then later on the slides I'll cover salty and sour. So um, Let's see, so the bitter uh, re taste receptors, they're the T2R family uh, of G-protein coupled receptors. And um, so the way I remember T2R is bitter because it doesn't have a partner. It's like lonely <laughs> T2R, so it's bitter. It doesn't have a heterodimer. Um, so, and then I'm sure it'll be a test or board question. <laughs> um, and you then both, of them. both. Okay, so guys, listen up. Um, so <laughs> then we have the sweet um, receptors, which are the T1R2 plus T1R3, and um, then we have the umami, which is the T1R1 and T1R3. And the way I remember um, T1R2 is uh, sweet because it has a two and two people. I don't know. <laughs> and this is R1. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a little bit of an introduction to them. Okay. And then I'll quickly go over the mechanism of how uh, the signal is transduced. Um, so, the principal pathway for a taste transduction um, occurs via the, uh, the beta gamma, not the alpha, um, subunit. So um, upon binding, the um, beta gamma subunits are freed from the taste um, uh, G-protein coupled receptor, and um, they interact, interact functionally, functionally with the phosphate lipase. And um, so then PLC beta 2 uh, stimulates synthesis of IP3, which opens up um, channels right here. Uh, releasing calcium into the cytosol of the receptor cells. So the elevated intracellular um, calcium appears to have two targets, here and here. Um, uh, so a taste-selective cation channel, um, TRPM5, and a gap junction hemichannel um, right here, PANX1, which As Asya mentioned earlier, which releases um, ATP. Um, let's see. So... All right, let's move on since we're short on time. Um, this is quickly, this is the um, taste receptor for um, sour taste. Um, let's see, okay, so sour taste um, stimuli excite presynaptic cells, uh, but the ion channel um, that transduces acid stimuli still remains unidentified. Remember I told you guys that um, this over here, we've identified PANX1, or this paper supports PANX1 based on findings, but over here, it's still a candidate. We don't know the channel, um, but the candidates are PKD2L1 uh, right here, and then PKDIL3, or 1L3. Um, so let's see. So um, they think these are the candidates, these two, PKD2L1, PKDIL3, because um, this channel is sensitive to extracellular pH rather than a drop in cytoplasmic pH, which is known to be the stimulus for sour taste. And then lastly, I'll cover um, uh, the ENAC ENAC channel, uh, which is the amyloride sensitive uh, epithelial sodium channel, which gives us the sense of salt because of release of sodium. So yeah, that's it. All right, guys, it's going to cut off at 12. Um, Alexi says he's going to record my part real quick, and I think we're on still lockdown, right? So.
we're still stuck in here. So I'm just going to go through my stuff. Um, if we're not stuck in here, if they... have no choice. Whether you want it or not, the scholar is going through his stuff. I'll try and keep it short because my stuff is kind of generally overview and then like future research that can be done. Um, so I'll just go over it. So this is just a, a general um, slide. <laughs> just bolt out of here. Right, I'll try to keep it short, guys. Um, general overview slide. This is not completely correct because, like Ossia said, um, ATP is released through the Pinexin channels, so they don't have a, a neurotransmitter vesicle binding and release into a synaptic cleft. Um, but the main thing that this part of the, um, the research paper was talking about was that there is calcium signal in the cytoplasm that triggers exocytosis, which we do have to know. So that's, that's very important. Um, also, that receptor cells are umami, sweet, bitter, uh, and that presynaptic cell are salty and sour. Um, these two slides here are just kind of a general overview slides that are more specific to the salty, sour, sweet, and bitter. You can look over them if you want. They're pretty neat. Uh, this one and the next part of the paper was information processing. It's kind of general overview of what Ossie was talking about and, uh, and what Afreen mentioned. Uh, there's a paracrine and autocrine function of ATP as well, and for serotonin, that's released. There's also paracrine and autocrine functions where it interacts with each other to either inhibit or um, um, or not different cells. So um, serotonin is released by presynaptic cells also that may also inhibit receptor cells. Uh, the opposing effects of the positive perinergic autocrine and negative serotonergic paracrine feedback in the taste bud during gustatory activation combine to shape the signals transmission from the taste buds to the, the hidden brain. Uh, let me see. All right, the next slide is also a general overview. It shows the ATP being released by the receptor cells and then the serotonin being released by presynaptic cells. Uh, not, not too much there. Just a nice picture. Now, for this one, um, now, kind of a disclaimer, I tried to come up with some analogies that were food related, and I was hungry while I was writing this, so there's some awesome pictures that'll probably make you hungry just in time for lunch. Uh, so, for the labeled line model um, that's proposed, it's usually one dedicated taste receptor signal sent per one taste cell, um, whether it's the presynaptic cell or receptor cell. And so what I used to kind of analogy, to do analogy to that is in and out Actually, this is a good picture. So in and out it's a really nice picture. So the way I was thinking of it, uh, to kind of explain, is that the in and out that establishment, uh, that fast food place, they serve uh, certain types of foods. So you're, every time you go there, you're in a consistent service with a particular type of food um, or foods and then when you go there. And so that, I was trying to you know, make it seem like one taste receptor for one taste cell, you're gonna get one kind of food from that place. That's the, the idea with In-N-Out. Um, now the next part. <laughs> so the next one is the across fiber model. Now the across fiber model, there's two parts of this model. There's the one uh, side on the left where it says B, where one taste cell contains potentially all of the different taste receptors for different taste senses. And so I kind of likened that to um, going to Yard House. I love Yard House. So at Yard House, you can get uh, a burger, you can get fries, you can get a pizza, tomato basil biscuit, I love. It's a great combination, by the way. Uh, you get beer, which is a little bitter, mm -hmm. and I know you, all you guys love beer, and I love beer too, so you can get beer. Uh, you can get sweet, it's fantastic, right? So that's, that's for that, <laughs> that's for B, that's the one cross fiber model. Now the next one, um, I tried to make an analogy with um, food courts. So if you think the food court as um, one taste cell, um, then that could potentially have different uh, fast food restaurants that you can go to and the different pathways once you're in that area that you can go to. And the idea with this, let me go back a little bit, um, you can kind of see here, and in this other picture, there's some crossing of fibers down here within the nerves and everything. So you could have, you know, one food court that contains different uh, types of receptors and cells, but the fibers are crossed, so you get a mixed signal. Um, so these are the two different models. So I'm not sure that helps you guys, but I was hungry. <laughs> Excellent analogy. Very good, very good. Now the next thing is for future uh, Actually, sorry, it's part of the crap of the code. 
Now, this one, what they did, uh, they took uh, rats and they replaced their sleep receptor uh, receptors with an opioid receptor. Right. You're right, Thomas? There's a meeting here. Uh, so basically, they, did, they replaced the opioid uh, sweet receptor with an opioid receptor, gave it an um, artificial uh, taste in, which is the blue right here, and they wanted to see if um, it would affect the rat's ability to taste. And basically, what happened was that you know, no matter if you replace it with anything, the uh, rat was still kind of interpreted as a sweet type of sense with the artificial ligand. Um, and so it's similar to replacing a physical key on your keyboard. So it wouldn't matter if you replace it, the S with an A, you still get an S um, written on your computer. So that's essentially that. And other future directions for research are uh, different dimers like and combinations for sweet and umami. Um, so there's sweet, metallic taste, trying to determine if there's any separate for that. Obviously fat, which was mentioned earlier. Astringent, uh, which apparently if you eat on a banana peel, it's astringent tasting. So I'm trying to find astringent receptors. Um, this is just a general overview uh, for the 7, 9, and 10. I go to the solitary nucleus, the VPN, and then select port which you have to know. Uh, and so there's also one more thing. Uh, there's a potential thing for temporal coding, which we've are, the scientists have already kind of uh, found is a case for auditory and uh, one other like I remember at the moment. But I kind of likened it to uh, Morse code. So if you have Morse code, the signal is based off of either a dash or a dot, and it can represent A, B, C, or different parts of the alphabet. And so that's kind of what temporal coding is like. It's like Morse code. So that helps hopefully those. And that's essentially it. Uh, there's one more, but we're out of time. So um, although this one I will mention real quick because on the discussion board, Dr. Nosrat mentioned SSRIs. And he said, and I quote, a step in degrading serotonin from synapses is reuptake of the neurotransmitters through specific transporters. Many new antidepressants utilize transdepressants utilize the property, property to allow for longer lasting effect of serotonin. These are called SSRIs, obviously, and selectively inhibiting reuptake of serotonin. The reason it's important is because some of the future research is how um, your gustatory mechanism can affect your mood. So you know, here's depression and anxiety, and this, um, this is kind of a, a mood map. And so what the, that one study did is it found if you increase serotonin, you can lower the threshold, uh, and that could affect you in different ways. Uh, and that's, I had to, had to find this because uh, Kelly thought it was hilarious. So um, it could also, future research can help uh, affects different therapeutic approaches for obesity, so if you're obese, you get fit. Great presentation. I Thank you for staying. Yeah, thanks. Oh, so. sure, no, we had no choice. Hopefully, my choice. We're going to uh, pick up some of these.